As it turns out, all of these chronic diseases that Kiki mentioned before, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease, the diseases which now cost 75% of healthcare dollars, the diseases that are killing way more people than viruses ever did, COVID or otherwise ever did, right? These eight diseases are all diseases of metabolic health. They are all diseases inside the cell. Well, it turns out the drugs that we use don't get there. The drugs we use don't fix the problem because all of these diseases are diseases of the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the little energy burning factories inside each of our cells. And what they do is they turn food into chemical energy. That chemical energy is called ATP. Anything that reduces your mitochondria's ability to make ATP is going to make you sick. It's going to, it basically, it, 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 it is a poison. So the question is, food is supposed to increase your ATP. Well, guess what? There are certain items in our diet that they actually poison your mitochondria so that you make less ATP. And when you make less ATP, guess what? you get sick. So how to distinguish what is beneficial for your metabolic health versus what is detrimental? Hello, wherever you are around the world. I hope you're doing very well. And if you're watching on the replay, hi there too. My name is Luke. I am a producer at How To Academy and welcome to what I'm sure is gonna be a brilliant event held in collaboration with Mind Health 360. Today, we are very lucky to be joined by Dr. Robert Lustig. Dr. Lustig is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics, Division of Endocrinology at the University of California, San Francisco. He specializes in the field of neuroendocrinology with an emphasis on the regulation of energy balance by the central nervous system. And his research and clinical practice has focused on childhood obesity and diabetes. Dr. Lustig's new book, Metabolical, The Truth About Processed Food and How It Poisons People and the Planet is out now. Today, Dr. Lustig will be in conversation with writer, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, Kirkland Newman Smulders. Kirkland is the co-founder and trustee of the Horizon Foundation and founder of the mental health not-for-profit Mind Health 360. She has worked for Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Prince's Trust, and was co-chair and trustee for Lessons with Love, a charity with, which supports refugee communities in Bethlehem. Today, Dr. Lustig and Kirkland will be speaking about the science of optimal diet from keto to vegan, Mediterranean to paleo. Advice on nutrition and supplementation is confusing and conflicting at the best of times. So what should we actually be eating for our long-term health? Well, today, hopefully, we'll get a bit closer to finding out. So after 45 minutes or 50 minutes of conversation, Kirkland and Dr. Lustig will take questions from you, the audience. So please type any you have in the Q&A function, wherever it is on your screen, and we will get to them at the end. Well, that's more than enough from me. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Robert and Kirkland. Kirkland, over to you. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. And it's wonderful to be in conversation with one of my heroes, um, Dr. Robert Lustig, who is one of the most knowledgeable, engaging, charismatic, smart people you'll, you'll ever hear talk. So we're in for a treat. And first of all, what I, I mean, his book, his latest book, so he's written some wonderful books, um, Fat Chance, um, which was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, he's written um, The Hacking of the American Mind, which is all about, um, you know, the addiction uh, and the reward pathways that we face in our mental health. He's written The Fat Chance Cookbook. Sugar has 56 names and his um, YouTube video, Sugar, the Bitter Truth has over 12 million views. And his latest book, which I think is absolute treasure trove of information is called Metabolical, the Truth About Processed Food and How It Poisons People on the Planet. Now it's a huge book um, and it has, it's absolutely packed with incredible information. And we're gonna have a really hard time distilling some of this information in 45 minutes, but we'll do what we can. 
so that, you know, and I will shut up very quickly because Robert is just the most incredible speaker. In this book, Robert takes us through the crisis in modern health. Life expectancy, quality of life, and health span are going down. So for the first time in the last four years, in fact, life expectancy has actually decreased in the U.S. and not because of COVID. And we're also witnessing an epidemic of chronic non-communicable diseases. So it used to be that we would die of viruses and bacteria. Now we're dying of chronic diseases, which such as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, fatty liver disease, cancer, dementia, as well as mental health issues, addiction, depression, anxiety, and autoimmune conditions, which are increasing in prevalence and severity. Now, what's really interesting is that modern medicine does not have satisfactory answers because modern medicine essentially treats the symptoms and not the causes while creating a host of side effects in the process. What's really interesting about these non-communicable diseases is that they're not druggable, as Professor Lustig tells us, they are foodable. So the only way that we can really address these and prevent them is by using food. Now, Robert, tell us what compelled you to write this book and what were your, what, you know, it's a sort of cry of passion and protest. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Kiki, I hate to tell you, but you're one of my heroes because one of the reasons I wrote this book was your story. Okay? Because you suffered from inordinately difficult depression, intractable depression, and you used food to get out of it. In fact, medicines didn't work for you either. And that was an enormous inspiration for wanting to get this information out to the public. So everyone, please, you know, recognize this is a collaborative arrangement here. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Kiki's uh, Mind Health 360 can help everyone, not just, uh, not, not, not just her. Uh, so the, 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 the short uh, answer to the question is, um, the uh, problem of chronic disease has now overtaken modern medicine. Okay, as you said, it used to be we died of microbes. We now die of uh, corporations. And the problem is those corporations are providing us with stuff that is actually metabolically dysfunctional. So we are being, in no uncertain terms, poisoned to death, right? And the problem is we don't know what's the point, where the poison is, what the poison is. People talk all the time now about this concept of food as medicine. Well, it can be medicine, but it can also be poison. And that, you know, distinction, that dichotomy is really important. Newsweek just uh, six months ago had on its cover, toxic food. Well, you know, fact of the matter is, some food is toxic. So what I want to do today is brief the audience with three terms, three terms that are always mangled and people do not know what they are. So here they are. First one, food science. So food science is what happens to food between the ground and the mouth. The second one is nutrition. Nutrition is what happens to food between the mouth and the cell. And finally, the third is metabolic health. And that's what happens inside the cell. As it turns out, all of these chronic diseases that Kiki mentioned before, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease, the diseases which now cost 75% of healthcare dollars, the diseases that are killing way more people than viruses ever did, COVID or otherwise ever did, right? These eight diseases are all diseases of metabolic health. They are all diseases inside the cell. Well, it turns out the drugs that we use don't get there. The drugs we use don't fix the problem because all of these diseases are diseases of the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the little energy burning factories inside each of our cells. And what they do is they turn food into chemical energy. That chemical energy is called ATP 
for all of you who took Bio 101 back in high school, you probably remember those three letters, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The energy is in the phosphate bonds. The mitochondria make ATP. And anything that poisons your mitochondria, anything that reduces your mitochondria's ability to make ATP is going to make you sick. It's going to it basically, it, 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 it is a poison. So the question is, food is supposed to increase your ATP. Well, guess what? There are certain items in our diet, certain edibles, certain consumables, and I don't want to call them food, but they actually poison your mitochondria so that you make less ATP. When you make less ATP, guess what? You get sick. So how to distinguish what is beneficial for your metabolic health versus what is detrimental? And that is the reason I wrote Metabolical is to make those distinctions clear not just clear to the public, but clear to the food industry because they're the ones poisoning us. That's fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that you talk about in your book, which I found fascinating was the eight subcellular pathologies that underlie all chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. And you say all of them are nutrient sensing. And just to list those, and they're a little complex, there's glycation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, which you just referred to, insulin resistance, membrane integrity, inflammation, epigenetics, and autophagy. Now, we've heard a lot about inflammation being at the basis of most chronic disease. We are starting to hear more about mitochondrial dysfunction. In the past, we've heard about oxidative stress. Now, the interesting thing about these eight subcellular pathologies is that, as, as we were saying, there is no drug to treat any of them. So when the eight processes are working right, they promote longevity and health. However, when they're not working right, they promote chronic disease. So what is the best way? I mean, to summarize one thing that you say in your book over and over again, which is absolutely brilliant, is the way you deal with this and the way to promote longevity and health is to feed the liver no, protect the liver and feed the gut. And this is your mantra throughout the book. Now, can you talk us through, you know, we know that processed food does the opposite of that, but can you talk us through how processed food impacts those eight subcellular pathways and how we can actually, you know, get those to work for us rather than against us? Indeed. So the first thing people need to understand is that the eight diseases that we talked about, the diseases of metabolic syndrome, are actually not diseases. They're the symptoms of disease. Type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cancer, etc. These are symptoms. And we say that we have medicines for these diseases, but we don't. Okay, like for instance, heart disease. Okay, well, throw a statin at it. So a statin will lower your LDL. The question, problem is the LDL is not the problem. This LDL is the symptom of the problem. In fact, if you take a look at the uh, uh, improvement in uh, longevity due to primary prevention using a statin, the total number of days gained is four. Wow. You will live four days longer taking a statin than not taking a statin. And of course, you will have spent about, you know, uh, uh, 20,000 pounds in, uh, in about 20 years uh, for four days. Now, maybe some people think that's a good trade. I don't, I don't think so. And in fact, statins have significant side effects. Rhabdomyolysis, where your muscles basically break down. Diabetes, because they themselves are a mitochondrial toxin. So there's an example. Um, Oral hypoglycemics for type 2 diabetes, right? They increase insulin release so that it will bring your blood sugar down. That's true. But every single study that looks at intensive therapy using oral hypoglycemics for diabetes show no improvement in mortality. If anything, you actually die sooner. Doesn't matter if it's the UK PDS study, the Accord study, the advanced study, they all basically show no improvement. So you can get your blood glucose down, you can get your hemoglobin A1C down, and it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Right? 
any hypertensives, you're treating the symptom, not the cause. Okay, each of these is downstream of the problem. And these eight pathologies that you just mentioned, glycation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, etc. These are the true subcellular pathologies. So how does processed food influence these pathologies? Now, the first one is glycation. Glycation is why um, uh, you paint barbecue sauce on your ribs before you put them on the grill to get that caramelization. Well, guess what? We're all caramelizing inside, all right? All the time. It is a, you know, the reaction of life. It happens whether you like it or not. And it doesn't need an enzyme. It happens just, you know, de novo. It's why you get wrinkles. It's why you get cataracts. It changes um, uh, arterial uh, uh, capacity. It changes stiffness. It uh, alters uh, how well your brain works because every time a glucose is added to a protein, it makes that protein less flexible. And every time a glucose is added to a protein, it releases a little hydrogen peroxide. That's called oxidative stress. Now, that hydrogen peroxide might be good if you're trying to clean a wound, but inside a cell, that's actually causing dysfunction. That's actually causing cells to die. So, and that's what, by the way, why our cells need antioxidants is to quench those re uh, reactive oxygen species, that oxidative stress. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, blueberries are good, for instance, you know, is to increase your antioxidants. The point is that these processes go on whether you like it or not. The only way to stop these processes is to be dead. All right. So, but you can slow them. You can't stop them, but you can slow them. Well, the way to slow them is by not eating the stuff that makes it run faster. And that is glucose, i.e. refined carbohydrate and fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, which makes those, that reaction run seven times faster than glucose. So we're talking dietary sugar. We're talking the sweet stuff. And people say, well, wait a second, hold on, hold on. What about fruit? Fruit's healthy, right? Fruit has those antioxidants. Yes, they do. Okay. But fruit has a little bit of sugar, not a lot. But when you turn it into juice, you're actually taking away the antidote. The antidote. The antidote is fiber. Okay. Now, people think fiber is the stuff you throw in the garbage after you've juiced the fruit. Turns out the fiber is the reason to eat the fruit in the first place. And by the way, the antioxidants travel with the fiber fraction. So when you throw the, the fiber away, you're actually throwing a lot of the antioxidants away too. So why is fiber important? Fiber reduces the rate of absorption from the gut into the bloodstream of glucose and fructose and simple starches. And basically what that's doing is it's protecting the liver. It's keeping the liver from the tsunami of uh, oxidative stress and glycation that's about to come when you, for instance, drink a, you know, eight ounce glass of orange juice. But if you eat an orange instead, you are getting a much lower bolus of sugar and you are getting the requisite fiber you need to actually block that early absorption, thus protecting the liver. And if you don't absorb it early, that means it goes further down the intestine where the microbiome is, where the bacteria are. So each of us has 10 trillion cells in our body, but 100 trillion bacteria in our intestine. Our bacteria outnumber us 10 to 1. Each of us is really just a big bag of bacteria with legs. Well, those bacteria have to eat something. Well, what do they eat? Well, they eat the fiber. So when you deprive your intestine of fiber, your intestine, those bacteria are now starving. Well, they ain't going to starve. They're going to survive. So what do they do? They eat you. They eat the mucin layer right off your intestinal epithelial cells, denuding them. And that ends up leading to irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, a phenomenon we call leaky gut, which allows lipopolysaccharides, which are inflammatory proteins, cytokines, which are inflammatory proteins, and whole bacteria for that matter, to basically get from the intestinal lumen, the inside of the intestine, through the uh, intestinal barrier into the bloodstream, 
ending up in the liver and causing inflammation. And then for that reason, causing insulin resistance and therefore metabolic dysfunction also. So it is essential to feed your gut. So you have to protect your liver from sugar, from other things too, like from glyphosate, you know, the Roundup, from uh, heavy metals like cadmium, which is in, you know, cheap cocoa, um, and, uh, and from branched chain amino acids, which are in processed corn-fed beef, chicken, fish. And you have to feed your gut and you have to feed your gut fiber in order to, number one, uh, set up that gel that prevents the early absorption and also to feed the microbiome so that your microbiome will actually work for you instead of against you. All of these things mean real food. Mm. And that's the point of metabolical is that all of these pathologies, all of these subcellular pathologies are foodable, not druggable. There's no medicine that can fix them, but food can, but it's gotta be real food. Processed food is the opposite. Processed food is poison. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the key message really of your book. I mean, there's so many messages in this amazing, densely populated, amazing book, but um, is, is really that we have to eat real food because real food is what contains the fiber, but we also have to eat you know, low sugar and essentially processed food they take away the fiber and they add the sugar and they add the salt and they have the, the bad fats. That's another thing that you talk about in your book is the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s because we know that it should be one-to-one, -one, but in fact, in processed foods, it's usually 20 to one omega-6s to omega-3s. Now, omega-6s are pro-inflammatory, whereas omega-3s are anti-inflammatory and therefore protective. Can you, so we know that we have to steer clear of processed foods but it's a tall order, especially in our teenagers and in our kids. It's a tall order also because it's actually cheaper to eat processed foods than it is to eat real food. And so, you know, I think the next part of this conversation should really be okay. You know, we know that we shouldn't eat processed foods, but how do we navigate the fact that there's advertising, that sugar is addictive, that our teenagers crave, you know, processed foods, that it's cheaper to eat processed foods. How do we na navigate that challenge? So first of all, it's actually not cheaper. Okay. They say it's cheaper, but it's actually not cheaper. If you know how to shop, if you know how to navigate the grocery store, if you know how to be able to, you know, squeeze and freeze at home, you can actually make a meal for less money than it would if you actually bought it at a fast food restaurant. Now, the problem is time. And that's something that costs money too. And people, you know, you know, have basically abdicated, you know, their money for their time. And I recognize that. And the point is that there are ways to make processed food healthier. There are ways that the food industry could change what they are doing. They could re-engineer their products to make them healthier. They don't. One of the reasons they don't is because, number one, they don't want to do anything that's going to cost them money in terms of research and development. Number two, subsidies. Okay, Subsidies are the big problem. What do we subsidize? We subsidize all the things that kill us. Corn, wheat, soy, sugar. That's what we subsidize. You see anybody subsidizing cotton? No, <laughs> you, you see anybody subsidizing radish or broccoli? Bottom line is we subsidize all the stuff that makes processed food cheaper. Well, if we got rid of all food subsidies and there's no economist on the planet who actually believes in food subsidies because they distort the market. And in fact, they have distorted the market. If we got rid of all food subsidies, then all of a sudden processed food would turn out not to be as cheap and it would actually make people gravitate more toward real food for just that reason. Because anytime you subsidize one thing, that means you have to tax everything else in order to make book, because it's not like the subsidy appears from nowhere, okay? So all you're doing is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Bottom line is if, you, if we got rid of all subsidies, people say, well, then the price of food would go up. Actually, 
the Giannini Foundation at UC Berkeley did this exercise. They asked this question, what if we got rid of all food subsidies? What would happen to the price of food? And it turned out the price of food wouldn't change except for two items, corn and sugar. And that's what we actually want to go up because of high fructose corn syrup and sucrose causing this metabolic derangement. So in fact, I understand why people say processed food is cheaper, processed food is convenient, processed food is tastier. And we have to get to that whole question of taste in a minute. Okay. But the bottom line is the only reason processed food is cheaper is because governments make it so. And that could be changed if people argued for the uh, change in uh, the food uh, production and procurement uh, practices that uh, currently exist today. So one of the reasons for education that we're doing right now. Now, let's just talk about this tastier business for a minute. People say processed food is tastier. Why is processed food tastier? The answer is because it's loaded with sugar. And it turns out the molecule fructose is not glucose. Glucose is the energy of life. Glucose, every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. Fructose, on the other hand, is completely vestigial. There is no biochemical reaction in any animal cell on the planet that requires fructose. It is a holdover from our plant ancestors. No one needs it, but we love it. And the reason we love it is because it is addictive. The molecule fructose acts on the reward center of the brain, just like cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol, and shopping, gambling, social media, internet gaming, pornography. There's one reward system in your brain, okay? Starts in an area called the ventral tegmental area in the base of the brain, which then transmits dopamine to another area called the nucleus accumbens, which is the reward center. And it just so happens there are numerous substrates that will make that reward center light up. And fructose is one of them. Now, we need reward. We need reward to get up out of bed in the morning, right? We need reward to be able to hold down a job. So it's not like we need, we should be doing away with reward. That's kind of silly. But the fact of the matter is that every single one of the things that I just mentioned, whether it be a chemical or a behavior, in the extreme leads to addiction. There's an holic after every one of those. Chocoholic, alcoholic, sexaholic, you know, uh, uh, shopaholic. The reason is because excessive chronic dopamine changes that reward center and makes it less uh, active. And that's a phenomenon called tolerance. Then throw a little bit of stress on top and you've turned tolerance into addiction. And so you know, every single one of these things in the extreme are addictive. And we have basically created an entire, you know, world population of sugar addicts. Yeah. And I mean, you know, teenagers in particular, young people, but I guess adults as well, kids. And this is a real problem because then, you know, not only do we know that processed food is bad for you and it's full of sugar and full of bad fats, it's and very low in fiber, but on top of that, it's addictive. And so that makes it very complicated. So we know that we have to eat real food and that we should avoid sugar, eat fiber. That's sort of the bottom line. But then a lot of people are wondering, you know, what should we eat? I mean, we're bombarded with so much information. You know, first it's the keto fad, then it's vegan saying, you know, meat is terrible. And you've got things like the China study, which say, you know, cancer rates go up when you eat meat. Um, you've got the paleo, uh, you've got, you know, all these different diets. Now, from your research, and you know, you've done a lot of it, apart from this really sort of what's become sort of a holy grail or a Bible, which is, you know, protect your liver, feed your gut, that those are the key presets. But which diet does that best? The short answer is, it depends on you. 
okay. it depends number one on your personal biochemistry which you now can learn there are ways to find out continuous glucose monitoring can tell you a lot okay so, uh, there are some genetic tests that can actually tell you a lot microbiome tests are starting to come into their own to tell you a lot Ultimately, all of this information right now is data. We have to turn it into usable information, but we're in the process of doing that. So my expectation is that within the next three to five years, there will be an algorithm for being able to determine your personal biochemical profile, which will then tell you what foods are the best ones for you to eat for your own personal health. Having said that, today, that's not quite there. Right? We do have continuous glucose monitoring that is available. And full disclosure, I am an advisor to several companies that use continuous glucose monitoring information to try to alter people's uh, eating patterns and people's diets in an attempt to try to improve health. We have not yet shown that it actually is, causes life extension, but we have good data on being able to actually mitigate the glucose and therefore the insulin spikes because those insulin spikes cause cellular damage. That metabolic health problem we talked about earlier, okay, is because of high levels of insulin. So keeping your insulin down is job one for any diet, but you don't know which foods will keep your insulin down unless you have some metric, some biomarker for figuring it out. Currently, glucose monitoring exists. Now, is that enough? Not even close, but it's a start, okay? It's the first thing out of the gate, right? Ultimately, we're gonna need ketone monitoring, we're going to need lactate monitoring, we're gonna need alcohol monitoring, we're gonna need insulin monitoring, and that's gonna be the big one. And uh, that unfortunately is about five years away. Okay, and we're also going to need postprandial triglyceride monitoring. All right, that's going to be even longer down the pike. So the point is that there's information to be had, and we are learning how to harness that information, and that will tell us which diet is best for which person. But in the meantime, until that's a real thing, and it's not a real thing yet, but until that's a real thing. There are certain precepts that we know do work. One is get the insulin down any way you can. You want a low insulin diet. Now, there are two basic ways to have a low insulin diet. One is don't make the insulin go up. Well, what makes the insulin go up? Refined carbohydrate and sugar. So we would call that a low carb diet. Okay? but it has to be a really low-carb diet. Most people who go on a low-carb diet are not going on a low-carb diet. They are going on a medium-carb diet, and they're still making you know, their glucose rise, and they're still making their insulin rise. So the concept that you can be on a 35% carbohydrate diet and call that low-carb is a joke. Mm -hmm. If you're really on a low-carb diet, you better be below 25% carbohydrate. How can you determine that? Well, you have to know your ketones, all right? Is there a way to know your ketones? Well, actually there is now, there's a breath ketone meter that's available or a urine, you know, you can ch check your urine for ketones. But the bottom line is if you are, if you think you're on a ketogenic diet and you're not, you know, because you're, you're, you're eating more carbohydrate than you should, then you're on the worst diet. You're on a high fat medium carbohydrate diet, which is the single worst diet possible. So either go whole hog or don't. So that's one way. The second way is what the vegans do. Now, I'm not against veganism. I'm not for veganism. I'm not against ketogenic diets. I'm not for ketogenic diets. What I'm for is getting the insulin down. That's what I'm for. <clears throat> so people say, oh, Lustig, he's low carb. Not true. Oh, Lustig, he's the anti-vegan. Not true. Okay. What I am is for real food. So why is real food okay? Why does real food get your insulin down? Well, because real food has fiber. And fiber 
by blocking that early absorption is keeping that glucose and insulin rise in check. And if you look at the data in the literature, it turns out a high fiber diet will do as good a job at suppressing that glucose and insulin spike as a low carb diet will. So in fact, the vegans and the ketos are actually on the same page, okay? They think they're actually antagonists to each other. They need to actually band together and um, attack the, the real culprit, which is processed food because that's the thing that never works. That's the thing that our bodies can't handle. And the reason is because that's the thing that makes your glucose and your insulin go highest. And that's the thing that causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's the thing that ultimately leads to chronic metabolic disease. So for instance, you know, you mentioned in your book that the US rate of diabetes is 9.4% of the population versus in India, which is 8.8% .8 of the population. And yet in India, you know, they don't eat beef, for instance. You also mentioned that in Argentina and New Zealand, we, they eat twice as much meat per capita as in the US, and yet they have much lower rates of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Right. So in some ways, you've, you know, you've very much shown from those statistics, I think that, you know, it's not the meat that's the issue. It's more the processed food or the carbohydrates that are around that. Is that correct? So in, in my book, there's a, a, a figure and I took it, uh, it's a photo that I took in a Rome restaurant window uh, back in 2016. And I love this photo. It, it, show, it, it shows uh, Italian beef on the top, then Argentinian beef in the middle, and finally U.S. grade A prime, you know, corn-fed beef on the bottom. And what you can see is that the Italian beef and the Argentinian beef are nice and pink, red, and homogeneous all the way through. And then you look at the U.S. beef and you see all this marbling. Now, in America, we prize our beef on the marbling. We sell it all over the world because you can cut it with a butter knife because of the marbling. Well, that marbling is intramyocellular lipid. That marbling is fat in the muscle. That animal has metabolic syndrome because it got fed corn. The Italian beef, the Argentinian beef, they didn't get fed, fed corn. What they feed on, they fed on grass. Okay, they don't lay down fat in their muscle because they are not sick. Mm -hmm. Okay, it also takes 18 months for a cow in Argentina to go from birth to slaughter, whereas it only takes six months in America for a cow to go from birth to slaughter. And the reason is because we fatten them up. We give those animals metabolic syndrome on purpose to fatten them up because number one, the meat is, you know, uh, tastier and because of the fat, uh, well, or, but it's actually not tastier. It's, it's just a little easier to cut and also for cash flow because, you know, we can move the, the cows through, through the, the system faster. So in fact, the Italian beef and the Argentinian beef are way healthier yeah. than American beef. Now, American uh, cows are fed on what we call concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Okay? There's no pasture. There's no grass. There's no food that isn't brought in. And what do they bring in? They bring in corn. And because they bring in corn, they are nutrient deficient. Because they're nutrient deficient, they get sick, they get infections easily. So what do the uh, ranchers have to do? They have to inject them with antibiotics. And so there are antibiotics all throughout the meat, right? And that allows them to be able to grow faster because you've sterilized their microbiome, which actually causes chronic metabolic disease, inflammation, and more fat deposition. So in fact, the way we process cows in America actually leads to the problem. And then on top of that, when you um, kill off the microbiome, the methanogens, the methane producing bacteria, they don't get killed off by those standard antibiotics. They end up populating the entire intestine 
of the cow. And so cows today in America produce five times the methane than they used to back in 1968. So everybody says, let's get rid of the cows because of climate change. In fact, all we'd have to do is get rid of the antibiotics, but we can't get rid of the antibiotics until we get rid of the CAFO. But that means again, real food. It always comes back to real food, any which way you cut it. Understood. And it's also, you know, the quality of that real food, essentially. So how the meat is fed is very important. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that you raise in your book, which I found fascinating, which is, you know, processing isn't simply what's done by industry. It's also what we do at home when we cook our food. Mm -hmm. And you raise a lot of issues around the way we cook our food and how we can turn good real food into very toxic, poisonous food for ourselves, whether it's by overheating olive oil, for instance, or creating, you know, ages and, and when we cook our vegetables or our meat and charcoal and all these sort of carcinogenic compounds. Can you talk us through that? Because essentially when we cook things, we're processing them ourselves and that has huge nefarious consequences. Right. So the watchword of the, of the book is it's not what's in the food, it's what's been done to the food that matters. And what's been done to the food can have been done by the food industry, or it can have been done to the food by ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So we process food at home too, when we cook it, or when we juice it, right? So the easiest, simplest, uh, you know, food processing technique at home that causes problems is juicing a fruit, right? So we end up taking the fiber and throwing it in the garbage, like we talked about before. Well, people say, oh, but I'm not uh, throwing the fiber away. I'm putting it in the smoothie machine. I'm putting it in the, you know, Breville or the Vitamix or the Nutribullet. Well, the fact of the matter is what you are doing is you are shearing the insoluble fiber to smithereens. Now, there are two kinds of fiber in fruit. There's soluble fiber like pectins or inulin, like what holds jelly together they're globular, and there's insoluble fiber, like cellulose, or chitins, like soft shell crab, you know, the outside of soft shell crab. Okay, those are insoluble fiber. You need both. You need both. Why do you need both? Because the insoluble fiber will form a lattice work, like a fishnet, on the inside of the intestine. The soluble fiber well, because they're globular, will plug the holes in the fishnet and you get this barrier. And this barrier then protects the liver and ultimately feeds the gut. So that being able to form that barrier is essential. But as soon as you take the orange and throw it into the, you know, Vitamix, okay, the blades of the Vitamix are going to shear that insoluble fiber, that cellulose into smithereens. You can't make a fishnet. It'd be like taking a million scissors and cutting a fishnet up into, you know, little pieces. Okay. It's not going to catch fish anymore. Right? Same thing happens in your intestine. As soon as you macerate that fiber so completely in a juicing machine, okay, it's not there anymore. The molecules are there, but the function has been destroyed. All right. So that's the simple, you know, the easy concept of how you can destroy food at home. Another one is French fries. All right. So French fries are carbohydrate, right? Potatoes, carbohydrate, okay, in oil, except that when you heat oil high enough, okay, what it does is it, uh, it, uh, it uh, binds to the carbohydrate and increases a uh, compound called acrylamide. And acrylamide has been shown to be a class A carcinogen. Another example is charcoal grilling. So charcoal grilling, I love charcoal grilling. <laughs> I'm kind of a semi-expert uh, and you know this, this pains me to no end. Um, but the fact of the matter is when you charcoal grill meat, you are creating aryl hydrocarbons, which bind to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor in the liver and can either cause obesity or it can actually cause um, uh, cancer, right? And so there are various maneuvers uh, that we do to food. Uh, olive oil, as you mentioned, or polyunsaturated oils, they, 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 they have double bonds, okay? As opposed to saturated fat, which doesn't, like lard. 
okay, does not have double bonds. Well, the double bonds are all cis double bonds, right? And cis double bonds are okay, and we can break those down. We have the enzymes to break those down. But when you heat a, a double bond oil, so olive oil or canola oil or soybean oil or any of these oils, okay, when you heat them super hot, which ten, people tend to do when they're frying, okay, you can put enough energy across that double bond so that the double bond will flip. And so instead of a cis double bond, now you've got a trans double bond. You have created a trans fat. And we know that trans fats are the worst fats because we don't have the enzyme to cleave that double bond. And so it ends up lining our livers and our arteries and causing chronic metabolic disease as well. So cooking techniques can ultimately lead to turning what was medicine into poison. So the key really is, you know, to, would you say then is raw food better? I mean, I know Vitamix, you can do vegetable smoothies and that's not great either, but so would you advocate for a raw food diet or would you just say use different oils that have a higher smoke point? So there's no question that raw food has, you know, you have not uh, altered uh, the, you know, the chemical structure of the food in any meaningful way. And so it will have, um, shall we say, uh, better uh, uh, absorption and um, uh, uh, glucose excursion kinetics in the body. That is true. Having said that, there are some things that you do to food when you cook it that actually liberates some of the micronutrients. So, you know, like for instance, B12, et cetera. So there's, there are things that you actually can and should do to food to be able to uh, access uh, many of the micronutrients. So no, I'm not specifically advocating for raw food. People who eat raw food do fine, and I'm not saying that there's a problem. However, there are certain things where actually cooking is appropriate. Like for instance, you know, eggs, I mean, raw eggs, you know, worry about salmonella, um, you know, uh, uh, raw spinach, you know, sometimes E. coli, especially, you know, you know, when the FDA is not looking, um, etc. So th there are advantages to uh, cooking that um, uh, get rid of some of the uh, bacterial uh, toxins and uh, contaminants that can cause, you know, uh, 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 food, uh, foodborne uh, illness outbreaks. And also raw food tends to be less digestible and cooked food can be more digestible and less of a strain on your digestive system. Now, before we get so, to questions- So it ends, up being, it ends up being a balance. You know, we're, we're walking the tightrope. So it's not like you should just eat raw food or you should just eat cooked food. You know, it, it, ultimately there's a balance to be, to be struck here. Absolutely. And before we get to questions, because there are a few questions here, I just wanted to ask you a couple more uh, questions. One was about intermittent fasting, because you mentioned in your book a lot about the benefits of intermittent fasting. And I know that it's quite a big food fad, um, diet fad. Could you tell us about the health benefits of that? Right. So intermittent fasting has two potential benefits. Okay. And these are real. And I'm not suggesting they're not. Intermittent fasting, because it gives your liver a chance to burn off any fat that has been created over the previous 16 hours, okay, is beneficial for improving insulin sensitivity. And that's a good thing. But it only works if you have fat in your liver that has to be burned off. The question is, why do you have fat in your liver that has to be burned off? The answer is because all the crappy food you ate before. So if you actually ate properly, if you ate healthfully, you wouldn't have liver fat that you needed to burn off, in which case then intermittent fasting wouldn't do very much. So if you are sick, intermittent fasting is a way to get better, especially if you have liver fat. The other thing that intermittent fasting will do is it will promote this phenomenon that I mentioned in the book called autophagy self-eating. It's basically recycling of various components that have gone bad in, in, the, in the cell. So defective mitochondria, lipid peroxidation products, uh, et cetera, things that have to be cleared out. It's like garbage night for the cell. And intermittent fasting tends to improve that. But there are many other things that can improve autophagy too, like eating real food. A Mediterranean diet increases autophagy too. So it's not like you have to intermittently fast. If you ate properly, these things would take care of themselves. Having said that, if you're eating poorly, 
intermittent fasting is a way to be able to jumpstart your you know, road back to metabolic health. Understood. And then one final question um, is about sort of food allergies and gluten, you know, the whole gluten-free craze and yep. food allergies. Now, what can you say about that? <laughs> so I'm actually a sufferer, just so you know. I do not have celiac disease. I have been tested several times. But back in 2018, I was really sick. And my gastroenterologist told me, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, it's all in your head. Here, try a FOD, low FODMAP diet, you know, which stands for fermentable oligosaccharides and, uh, um, you know, uh, other stuff. Um, I tried it and it didn't work either. Bottom line, I went to a meeting and the other keynote speaker was the head of pediatric gastroenterology at U of Chicago. He was one of the original celiac researchers. And he explained this to me in a way that made perfect sense and actually been supported. It's not gluten. Mm. It's wheat, specifically wheat, but not gluten. Mm. So wheat is a complex organism. It's got about 700 different antigens. The two that are famous are the two that make up gluten, which are gliadin and glutenin. Okay. And it's true that a lot of people do have allergies to those. And if you do, then you have real honest to goodness celiac disease. But you can be allergic to one of the other 698 antigens. And that's not gluten. But wheat still makes you sick. Now, gluten is also in barley and rye. But when you take white cells from people like me who don't have celiac but have this problem, Turns out barley and rye do nothing to, you know, to activate them. So, but, but wheat does. So there must be something in the wheat that's not in the barley and rye and it can't be gluten. So uh, Stefano Guandolini, the, the physician at U of Chicago, he wants to call this non-celiac wheat intolerance rather than non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Now, gluten-free foods will work as well so that's good, but it's not gluten, it's wheat. And so people could you know, save a whole lot of money not having to go to the doctor and just basically getting wheat out of their diet mm. as opposed to having to go whole hog gluten, which is actually much more difficult. Understood. So in terms of uh, people's questions, because there are quite a few that have come in, <clears throat> one of them is, do you recommend probiotics? And I know there's a whole chapter in your book on this or part, which is fascinating. So address that one. Yeah. You bet. So here's the problem with probiotics. Okay. Probiotics repopulate the intestine with, you know, whatever bacteria is missing. So the question is, why were they missing in the first place? And number two, since probiotics are live cultures, you should only have to take it once. And then it should take and proliferate and basically solve the problem after one dose. But you have to keep taking them. Why is that? Right? Well, one reason is because they don't work. <laughs> the other reason is because the probiotic company is trying to make money. The f well, why don't they work? And the answer is because for the same reason that the pro that that species of bacteria is not there in the first place is because the intestinal environment is inhospitable to it because of the crappy food you're eating in the first place so, so, so if you ate pro if you didn't eat processed food and you had a healthy microbiome taking probiotics might actually help would probably not make a difference okay okay because you wouldn't need those. So the question is not probiotics. The question is, how do you make the intestinal milieu? How do you make the intestinal environment more conducive to the growth of the probiotics? That's called prebiotics, okay? So prebiotics are the food for the, for the bacteria. The probiotic is the bacteria itself. And then there's even something called postbiotics, which I just learned about. Those are the chemicals that the bacteria make, like for instance, short chain fatty acids, which people are packaging up and bottling and selling separately. All right, so prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics. Okay, I'm for prebiotics. 
And the reason is because if you make your intestine conducive by you know, giving them the food they need to eat, i.e. fiber, then any probiotic will work and probably you wouldn't even have to take them because they'd be found in your food anyway. Understood. And that leads me to another question, which was, what are the best sources of fiber? And is it key to preventing bowel cancer, for instance? Right. So virtually every vegetable has fiber. It wouldn't be a vegetable if it didn't. Every fruit has fiber, although there are some fruits that are way lower in fiber than others, like for instance, bananas and grapes. They are pretty fiber poor as fruits go. But pretty much every other fruit, if you drew a scattergram, fiber on the bottom and sugar on the, on the, on the, on the side, okay, there'd be a diagonal. So pretty much every uh, uh, fruit has as much fiber as it has sugar, right? I mean, example, sugar cane, it's a stick. Can't even chew the damn thing, it's, it's so fibrous, all right? Has the most sucrose, and the most fiber all at the same time. Same, you know, that's the example. So the bottom line is any food that comes without processing will be fiber containing. An example, example, whole grain bread. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about whole grain bread. The question is, what is whole grain bread? Well, what is whole grain? So. The FDA says that if you start with a whole grain and you pulverize it to smithereens and you bake it up, that's whole grain bread because you started with whole grain. So if you started with whole grain, then it's whole grain bread. Wrong. The grain's not whole. It's been pulverized. So here's a wheat kernel, a wheat berry, if you will, right here. Okay. The starch is on the inside. The germ is on the inside and the fiber, the husk is on the outside. You need that fiber to be intact for two reasons. One, to protect the germ, which is where the nucleic acids, polyphenols, flavonoids, all the goodies are that you actually make that grain worth eating in the first place. You need that germ, which gets stripped out usually by food processing because the germ, those nucleic acids and polyphenols, they go rancid. And so if they're going to have any shelf life, then the food industry has to remove that on purpose to keep it on the shelf, all right? But you need that. That was the good part, right? Mm -hmm. And the fiber, basically, when it's intact, means that the, grain, the germ is still there, okay? But as soon as it's been pulverized, that's a whole nother story. In addition, so the, the enzymes in your intestine have to strip that fiber off, and that means that it's going to take a long time in your intestine. And that means it's going to have traveled further down the intestine. And so that starch is going to end up feeding your microbiome instead of you, mm. which is a good thing. That's a good thing. You're feeding your gut rather than you okay. because you're not absorbing it early because the fiber is still intact. Right? In addition, and this is something that people just do not understand and they really need to understand. If you weigh a wheat berry, and then you weigh the starch in a wheat berry, okay, in single wheat berry. Turns out 25% of the weight of the wheat berry is the fiber. 25%, one quarter of the weight of a, 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 a whole grain is its fiber. When you strip that off, you have changed the dynamics completely. So the fact is the food industry knows that. They can't make a a spongy, you know, glutinous bread when the, all, the, all the starch is locked up inside this fiber kernel. So what do they do? They pulverize it and then they make it. But now, hey, horse is out of the barn and you're going to absorb it just as fast, whether it was there or not. And so in fact, whole grain doesn't mean whole grain. It's got to actually be whole. So what does whole grain, real whole grain bread look like? Well, it looks like, for instance, German fitness bread, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like a brick. It's like, you know, thin and small, and it makes a lousy sandwich because it's so fibrous, it, you know, and it doesn't have a lot of gluten. And so it doesn't hold together. 
So if you took this and you threw it at somebody's head, it would probably knock them unconscious, okay? Because it's so dense. Okay, if you take a standard loaf of grocery store bread and you throw it at somebody's head, you know, it'll bounce off, you know, and then probably start a fist fight. Okay, but, you know, the fact of the matter is real whole grain bread is enormously dense and, and non-glutinous, and it is because of the fiber. So you have to be careful about what, when you read the label as to what it really is. Absolutely. Now, quickly, a few more questions, because there are some very good ones. Um, what do you think of dairy alternatives, such as soy milk and vegetable oil spreads? Right. So dairy is, for lack of a better word, good. Okay. Because you can put vitamin D in it, <laughs> because the dairy fat is not the same as red meat saturated fat, dairy saturated fat is odd chain fatty acids with a specific phospholipid signature, which has been shown to be protective against heart disease and diabetes. Now, I do know that the China study says that dairy causes cancer. There are some reasons to doubt that, okay? And that's a complicated discussion that we don't have time for right now. But um, I think that dairy is one of the things that we should be, uh, you know, putting more of in our diets. But what we need to do is we need to change the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in dairy in order to be able to um, uh, get more healthful dairy to people. And do we do that with grass-fed dairy um, animals? Yes, Grass-fed dairy animals will have way more omega-3s, or they can be added to uh, uh, milk, for instance. And there are several companies, you know, that uh, offer omega-3 enriched uh, dairy products, and those are going to be much better than the ones that are currently on the shelf. So there are things that can be done to re-engineer dairy products to make them more healthful. And in terms of, you know, dairy and meat, you know, is organic, and we haven't covered this, but organic, what's your view on organic? Is it much better? Is it? Well, so organic means no pesticides and pesticides are a problem. Like for instance, glyphosate, I'm not arguing that that's true. Okay. But, you know, there's poison in the sugar, <laughs> you know, and so if you have, if you drink organic orange juice, you're still going to get a, a, you know, a major, you know, glucose and insulin spike. It, you know, you can eat organic, you know, candy bars, and you're still going to get, you know, the same glucose and insulin spike. So organic doesn't solve the problem. It solves a specific problem. It doesn't solve all the problems. Yeah, understood. And then another question, what about the paleo diet, which we haven't uh, touched on? Right. So paleo diet, Mediterranean diet, okay, the bottom line is they have high, uh, low sugar and high fiber. Okay, so a paleo diet is just fine. The only problem with the paleo diet is it's expensive. Okay, I have nothing against, I have nothing against the keto diet, I have nothing against the uh, paleo diet, I have nothing against the Mediterranean diet, I have nothing against the traditional Japanese diet. To be honest with you, I have nothing against the non-processed vegan diet. I mean, you know, it goes across the board. What I'm for is a low insulin diet and a paleo diet is that. And one final question, because sadly we have to wrap up. I mean, you're so amazing. We could go on for hours. Um, what's the role of exercise and metabolism and are some kinds better than others? And I know that you mentioned that five of those eight subcellular pathologies are exercisable, whereas three of them are not. So, right. so you cannot outrun a bad diet. Okay. And that's what we've learned. There's no question that exercise is good for you. I'm not arguing that in the slightest, by all means, you know, exercise is one of the single best things you can do for yourself. But when you actually look at what exercise does and how it works, it will ameliorate five of those eight subcellular pathologies, but it won't ameliorate glycation. It won't ameliorate oxidative stress. It actually increases oxidative stress and it won't ameliorate um, uh, uh, methylation. Okay. It will improve many of, oh, and it, won't, and it won't improve membrane stability either. So it's actually four. So bottom line, you cannot outrun a bad diet. 
Yes, by all means, exercise. But if you think exercise is going to fix your problem alone, you got another thing coming. Understood. And then there's one final uh, question, which I know that you'd be fantastic to answer just because of your interest in politics is about the sugar tax in the UK, which has raised issues of class and race with regards to diet policy, low education rates and poverty. Um, you know, how important is empathy for these factors when making dietary suggestions? You know, I we, this problem comes up all the time and we could spend an hour on this problem all by itself. So I'm just going to give you the quick sound bite. Okay. It doesn't have to be regressive against the poor. It doesn't have to be. If we've altered subsidies, it wouldn't be regressive against the poor. But I'll tell you what's more regressive against the poor. Diabetes is more regressive against the poor. And so if a soda tax will reduce the rate of diabetes, those poor are going to be so much better off. It's not even funny. So the only people who are yelling uh, about soda taxes being regressive against the poor are the, uh, are the soda industry themselves. Understood. And then one final question, and then I promise we'll let you go. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in about people who are lactose intolerant and what can you do to substitute if you are? So if you're lactose intolerant, and I am, <laughs> um, it's a pain in the butt, no question, but you know, lactate milk, or lactate um, tablets will help do that. Um, uh, unfortunately, A2 milk does not fix that problem. That's a protein issue, not a lactose issue. Um, there are plenty of uh, you know, um, uh, uh, nut milks that are available on shelves now, like almond milk and uh, uh, you know, uh, oat milk, et cetera. Um, I'm not a big fan of them personally, but um, you know, other people are. And so, you know, there, there's, th those are your alternatives. What about things like soy? I mean, there's a whole thing against soy. Do you have a view well, on that? Soy is, soy is omega-6s mm -hmm. and so omega-6s are pro-inflammatory and we get way too much omega-6 in our diet. And omega-6s are the precursor of arachidonic acid, which is the precursor of thromboxanes, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes, which all basically make your, you know, immune system, you know, work, but sometimes a little too good. Yeah, understood. So you would go for nut milk over soy milk, essentially. Yes, I, or I would go for lactate over soy milk. Lactate over soy milk. Well, I must say, Robert, that was absolutely fascinating and fantastic, and I'm so grateful. And I, um, I'm very happy to answer or to send you any other questions that people have. So I'll give you my uh, email address, which is Kirkland at MindHealth360.com. And all these unanswered questions, I'm very happy to send to Robert and then get you answers because there are a few very interesting ones, notably on fecal transplants. Um, <laughs> But so feel free to, uh, to email me and I will make sure that your question gets to Robert. And Robert, thank you so much for your time. Thanks to the How To Academy for organizing this. And um, thank you all for being here and tuning in on a Monday evening. Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Kiki. It's always my pleasure.